Okay, Malcolm, always great to see you, my friend. Lots going on right now, including breaking news. So let's jump right into it. Sure. In light of the tragic death of Alexei Navalny, what should the White House's response and stance on the need for a thorough and a legitimate investigation into the circumstances surrounding his demise, considering his status as a prominent opposition figure to Vladimir Putin, what should the White House's response be right now? Well, the first response should be the one that uh, Joe Biden made last year, which is when he warned Vladimir Putin that there would be significant response, there would be significant sanctions and punishment from the United States if Alexei Navalny were to suddenly die in prison. Lo and behold, Alexei Navalny suddenly dies in prison. His wife was at the Munich uh, Security Conference and had just received come on stage right after Vice President Harris when she was informed that her husband was dead. That was someone. There is just no way that he dies the moment and she's informed the moment that she steps on that stage. This has all been part of an arc that Vladimir Putin has been drawing over this last week, where to be quite honest, Michael, I mean, you know, he feels that he can operate with impunity now. He feels that the United States has so weakened uh, by the Republican Party, by Donald Trump, that he can now start throwing punches, whereas he's been on the defense of all of this. So what should Vice President, I'm sorry, what should um, President Biden do? First off, I would announce the United States is immediately going after the 300 million in frozen assets uh, that belongs to Russia and that we fully intend to give it to the country of Ukraine. Second thing I would do personally, I would go to the nation of Italy as a personal appeal. And I would say, Vladimir Putin's near three quarters of a billion dollar mega yacht that is sitting in the Laspasia shipyards. We would like to actually seize that asset and turn it over as a, uh, a warship, uh, turn it over as a ship to the government of Ukraine and let them sell it off. I mean, just throw haymaker after haymaker. Let them know, OK, you want to play this game? Tucker Carlson's not going to help you here when we go after your wallet. OK. But if you take the mega yacht and you take the 300 million in cash, you're talking Ooh. about a billion dollars. To be very honest with you, I don't think Vladimir Putin would give a shit about a billion dollars because <laughs> while it may be more of an attack to his ego, what's a billion dollars to him? It's, there's no doubt in my mind that Vladimir Putin can burn Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos's money and still be the richest man in the world. So what's a billion dollars to him when he could steal that money from his country in 24 hours if he wanted to? It's nothing. I think the, personally, I think the response by the United States has to be economic, but I mm -hmm. think it has to be economically crushing to Russia, not to Vladimir mm -hmm. Putin's pocket, but to Russia as a whole, so that more Navalny's rise up from the ground and they start to say, no, 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 this is bullshit. Mm -hmm. This guy's got a $750 million yacht. He's got a three, $400 million house somewhere. He's got three, $400 million that the United States just seized. And we're all eating shit. We're basically being given sugar and vodka and a pack of cigarettes and told to enjoy ourselves while our sons, our sons are dying on a battlefield in Ukraine for no apparent reason at all except to make this motherfucker even richer. There has to be a much stronger response. I agree with you wholeheartedly. There has to be but a, a whole heart, a, 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 a national level response. But it also has to be international. We need to do this as a coalition as well. You know, I mean, as of a few days ago, everybody was thinking the United States is the weakest country on the planet, thanks to uh, Moscow Mike Johnson and, uh, you know, and uh, Donald Trump. And now I think, look, I'm still a big fan of stealing Bugsy Malone's wallet 
while you indict him and try to bring him to prison, right? Take down his empire. But, um, you know, that, that, that being said, that's going to take a coalition effort. And we have been trying to stop Moscow through sanctions and other methodologies. But whatever we're going to do, we need to do it now. We need to do it loud. And we need to show that we're not weak. We have some uh, ways of hurting uh, people that are sanctions busting. You know, I'm talking to you, United Arab Emirates, uh, and other countries that are helping them and their allies like Iran. You know, I was thinking as well when all of this happened, like, what implication do you think that Navalny's death will have on United States Russian relations, if any? Well, I mean, there's 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 two teams you're talking about playing with here. Russia, the people, and the people that you want to stoke up, right? You want to give them more opportunity to have a, a, a better world, a better chance, despite all that that bull and bullshit and noise that Tucker Carlson made as a propaganda effort for Moscow, showing that they have little shopping carts that you could put 10 rubles in and, and, and pull out, you know, and that they have cheap food because it's a sign that the, the economy is collapsing. You know, you want to try to keep them on side. So whatever effort we're going to have to make, we're going to have to clearly delineate that we would be supporting someone who was like Navalny or the people who are like Navalny who will put Putin into his place. And that's very important. As a Vladimir Putin, I mean, that man doesn't believe anything other than action, right? He's an old KGB hand. He understands about making people disappear at 30,000 feet, uh, you know, making you go to prison in Siberia and then poisoning you or forcing Throwing you, to- you out a fucking window. No, right. Yeah, those, that's right. You know, Moscow windows or, you know, polonium tea, all of the other methodologies he revels in. He loves that he terrifies his population with this. You have to make sure that he is personally sanctioned here. Start with his wife. Start with his kids who happen to be all over Europe. Right. Make sure that every person downstream of him is sanctioned, including their immediate families. All right. You can't have people like um, Gerasimov, chief of general staff of the Russian army, his son, all right, is in London, uh, you know, living an openly gay lifestyle and flaunting his father's stolen money while killing Ukrainians. All of them need to, they need to push down those, uh, you know, those sanctions lists and make it really hurt. And, you know, I'll tell you, it's um, no surprise with the murder of Alexei Navalny, the fact that Putin, KGB, forward thinker, right? Obviously a chess player. Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind he realized that the United States would have a reaction and that there would be implications to Russia, which is, of course, why they put out that propaganda bullshit about sending up nukes into space that they could wipe out our telecommunications, that they could wipe out our entire grid by blowing up our satellites in space. You yeah, think they literally. have that capability or you think he's fucking dreaming? Literally the plot of the James Bond movie, Goldeneye. <laughs> right, I mean, right. This is- Ludicrous. Anyone can send a weapon system into space and make that weapon system explode near a satellite or release an electromagnetic pulse going out to a thousand kilometers. Yes, but that's a nuclear weapon system you are lofting into space. Yes, Russia and the United States have satellites, which are nuclear power plants that are in space. But that is very different than a weapon system in which you're going to say you're going to do that. All right. As soon as you do that, first off, It's employment and threat of employment is tantamount to an act of war. It's employment is tantamount to an act of war. That's an act of war, which means the United States has the ability to take down satellites too, which we launch off of F-15s that go straight up into the stratosphere and launch an anti-satellite missile system that just smashes into your satellites. And we'll just go and take down system after system after system, right? Moscow doesn't have the ability to put things back up the way that we do. (coughs) Excuse me. So... Even if he has got this dream weapon system on the charts, we've seen what happened in Ukraine. His systems don't work very well. I think what he does is that he's got this. It's on the books. 
He's got all the scientists. Don't forget the Kinzhal missile, right? The dagger hypersonic missile system that he had was supposed to kill the U.S. Patriots' most advanced pack variant of the Patriot missile system. I was in Kiev the night that they fired 19 of these missiles at downtown Kiev and the Patriot in full automation, right? That means the operators didn't have didn't do anything. The system went the full automation, shot down all of these Kinzhal missile systems, all of them. That wow. Patriot they had was a 40 year old version of the ones that we had. So Moscow dreams big and they talk smack like we're going to use, you know, the Satan, you know, the, uh, missile, you know, nuclear bomb against London. OK, Britain has a submarine that has the ability to carry 240 that has 240 nuclear warheads. OK, nobody's nuking anybody. So they mm-hmm. talk for the, you know, the consumption of the of the Russian public. Uh, you know, and a bunch of old guys and, you know, who, who used to hang out with him in the KGB, but not to anybody else that's really an adult. You know what makes me the most nervous? Mm. What if hypothetically, and God forbid a million times, that Trump becomes president? Just imagine mm. the White House. This murder of Alexei Navalny is not something that is going to be done and over with in terms of investigations, accountability, you know, starting right in the White House under this Biden administration. That would then, of course, roll over to the next administration. And my fear, besides for Trump as president, who wants to be just like Vladimir Putin, everything that he's seeing right now that Putin did, the jailing of your critics, the killing of your critics. Look, we all, and I talk about this obviously ad nauseum, Mm -hmm. they jailed me as a critic. They violated my First Amendment constitutional right and sent me back to Otisville because I refused to waive my constitutional right off of an FLM, right? A federal um, location monitoring uh, agreement that didn't even exist. It was a fraudulent document that they mm-hmm. wanted me to sign. When I wouldn't sign the fraudulent document, they then turned around and remanded me, got an order of remand on a fake document and sent me back to Otisville. Alexei Navalny, Navalny was a critic, started mm-hmm. the anti-corruption group there right. in Russia, figured out and did as a journalist, a deep dive into all of Russia elite, starting with Vladimir Putin, to their obscene wealth. And this, of course, ticked them all off. So they raided the office, they jailed him and a couple of other people, and ultimately Mm -hmm. murdered him. What does Trump say that he's going to do? He's going to go after his critics. He wants to execute Joint Chief of Staff General Mark Milley. Why Why is this any different? So my question, what happens if Trump becomes president? Well, this is all a template. This is all a template. You're not talking the next administration. You're talking about the last administration in the United States. It's not an administration, right? I mean, it is tantamount to setting the United States up for civil war because Donald Trump won't wait for a minute. They've already announced. They've already announced that they would start rounding people up using the National Guard. Do you think he's going to stop at Latinos? You think he's going to stop at pro, you know, Palestine activists? Do you think he's going to stop at anyone who's an American? You think he'll stop at, you think he'll stop with, at uh, blacks? You think he'll stop at, um, you think he'll stop at Muslims? No, No. he'll start with them. Trust me. Trust me. Oh, he's not starting with them. Malcolm, he's not starting with them. He's starting with the most vocal critics against him. All right. Those are the people that he's going to start. And he sees what Vladimir Putin did as a strong man, as a tough guy, as a mob boss, which Mm -hmm. is what Donald wants to be, wants to portray himself as. And this country really better be fucking nervous. They really it's time that people understand the absolute and true danger that Donald Trump poses to this country, to democracy and most importantly, to the whole world. I mean, no one should believe you. No one should believe me. Believe him. He's saying right. this stuff. He, they're now, they as a group are starting to taste 
that they have a chance at victory based on these polls. And they're starting to salivate over the very idea that they could now arrest. And, and you know, they're using, by the way, they're using all of these prosecutions as a basis to say, well, you did this to me. It's all legal now even though this is all going through the entire ju ju uh, judicial processes, they don't care, all right? They are talking about making up kangaroo courts, sending out, using the armed forces, which, by the way, this is where your civil war will start, all right? Your civil war will start with soldiers who refuse to follow an unlawful order. The posse well, comment- you're going to find, find more than just, than just soldiers. You know, there's 400 million firearms in America, with I think 20% of that number, 80, was it like 80 million AR-15s, right? Yes. I no. assure you, the citizens of this country will take up arms and there will be fighting between civilians, military, the fucker, and I'm talking about Donald Von Schitz and Pants, the fucker <laughs> wants to bring in SEAL Team 6 to go after and to start incarcerating and arresting his critics. You I mean, know, this isn't this is not a television show, folks. This is the reality. Point. Do you you recall my last book is called They Want to Kill Americans, right? Yeah. The terrorists, uh, the terrorist in, insurgents and the deranged ideology of the cr coming Trump insurgency. I predicted that on real time with Bill Maher three days after the election, where Bill yeah. was talking kumbaya, and I was like, bro, insur insurgency is coming. And here's yeah. what you're talking about, the people with the guns. All right. Two thirds of those people with the guns are going to view themselves as self-deputizing Trump militias where they will yeah. band together with their guns and they'll say, well, we have the guns. Therefore, we have the power. And what we think you, the cops, the SWAT teams, the National Guardsmen, anyone that gets in our way, we've been deputized by Trump. Trump may even say it. Um, what was his name? Uh, the, the, the head of um, of the uh, of the Oath Keepers, Stephen uh, Rhodes. Right. Rhodes. Um, he actually said, I felt deputized by yep. Donald Trump. Right. Stuart. Rhodes. Now he's doing 18 years. By Donald Trump. And we were just awaiting the one word order. And if Trump had really known that, if he had really known there were thousands and thousands of armed people on January 6th, and it would get him in, not get him in trouble, I think he would yep. have given that order. But now we know. In trouble. He doesn't care. Now yeah, we know. He wouldn't care. So let me ask you this then, in furtherance, since we're staying on Putin for a quick second. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Putin cozies up to all of those that are adverse to America. So my question sure. to you is, what does Putin have to do with Iran? And how is it trickling down to Hamas and Hezbollah? Oh, well, funny you should mention that because I'm becoming well, not quite funny, the but yeah, yes, uh -huh. um, funny ho ho. Um, <laughs> well, first off, as you know, I served in Ukraine in the Ukrainian army. The Russians were facing a strategic defeat against the Ukrainian army. Then they got weapon systems from Iran, the Shahid 136 drones. They bought them by the thousands. Uh, I think the contract was 6,000 of them. They started throwing them at everything, including infrastructure in Ukraine. They started, Ukrainians defended against that. They needed more. Now, Russia, it appears, we even saw before the 10-7 massacre, we had seen pictures of PMC Wagner mercenaries training with Hamas fighters. We know that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps which is the expedition uh, irregular warfare arm of the Iranian regime, trained Hamas in all of its operations. That's the most important part that they've done. But the strategic alliance is Russia, Iran, Lebanon, and Hamas, right? That's the axis. Right. Whatever Russia supports, whatever Iran supports, Russia supports. Russia in Syria directly supports Iran's operations, giving Hezbollah in Lebanon, Syrian militias, operational support so that they can do whatever they want. Russia uh, supports Iran, which frees them up to do operations in Yemen. So this is an alliance, an unholy alliance to a certain extent, in which Moscow benefits from all the chaos 
that they allow that they allowed to happen throughout the Middle East. Look at the chaos that the attacks in Israel have have uh, have have garnered. Or, you know, 10-7 was a, an invasion of Israel. I've just come back from a month in Israel. 10-7 was an invasion of Israel. And what happens on a global scale? The entire global propaganda machine of Moscow amplifies yep. the pre-Palestine movement, the pretty much the pro-Hamas, pro-Hezbollah, pro-Yemenis Houthis, to where we've got stupid American kids in the United States cheering for terrorists in the Middle East. The only problem with these dumb kids is they don't seem to understand that at some point the FBI is going to, un is going to re unleash the material support for terrorism laws that we set up for ISIS. But Russia is benef not only benefiting it, slingshotting all of these movements using its global disinformation system. Worse, they seem to have Elon Musk on board. Even though Musk went to Israel and got his, his you know, his his, you know, bring them home dog tag, he manages to come back. And now we're finding out Russia is using Starlink, all right, up in Ukraine now, right? Russian forces are using Starlink, which is a sanctions violation for the United States. I mean, Elon Musk is, is, is he's viewing all of this as some great generator of vibe for Twitter or X as he calls it. This is chaos. The oligarchs are running everything. And you know, the crazy part is I used to be a very calm, <laughs> settled yeah, person. Me too. Once. Books on counterterrorism and intelligence. And now you see the intersection between the intersectionality, if you want to use that word, between the oligarchy, m massive amounts of money, American uh, billionaires who want to see Trump reinstalled. Have you ever wished that you had a whiter and a brighter smile? Well, before you visit a dentist, you should know that their whitening treatments can be very expensive. And it's not just the price. You also have to book the appointment and schedule time away from work or family to sit in a dentist's office chair while undergoing the procedure. I mean, let's be honest, it's a hassle. Fortunately, now you can try Smile Actives at home or anywhere, anytime. Smile Actives offers a safe and an affordable alternative to those expensive whitening processes. Like most people, I'm a big coffee drinker. I drink a ton of coffee. And over time, I've noticed that my teeth have lost some of their brightness that I was originally used to seeing. 97% of Smile Active users in a clinical trial reported up to six shades whiter on average, all within 30 days. I'm using it. Look. I mean, simply add Smile Active Pro Whitening Gel to your regular toothpaste. It's been formulated with PolyClean technology to boost stain removal and deliver active whitening ingredients into your teeth's grooves and crannies so that you get better whitening. Smile Actives makes a teeth whitening gel that can simply be added to your toothpaste every time that you brush your teeth. So no change in your routine, no extra time, and no more messy strips, trays, or lights. People will start commenting on your whiter, your brighter smile in just days. Smile Actives is the whitening boost your favorite toothpaste needs to give you the smile that you deserve. So I want you all right now to visit smileactives.com forward slash Cohen today to receive a special buy one, get one free offer with auto delivery plus free shipping and handling. That's smileactives.com slash Cohen. Terms and conditions apply, so see the site for details. Well, they're doing it only for their own pocket. They're not doing it because they believe in Trump or even anything he stands for. They only care about increasing you know, their net worth, which is insane because these are the folks that are making like a billion dollars a year, just an in interest, as if they fucking need more. That's the crazy thing. And they're willing to jeopardize our democracy for their own bottom line. I can't tell you the number of people that I know that, that think this way. And they don't even have to be the ultra one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent. I'm talking about people with a hundred million. They... They're all looking at Trump like a useful idiot 
in order to advance their own financial goals. But I want you to do me a favor because what do you, since I'm going to stay on Russia for a few minutes more here, what's stopping Russia from interfering in the 2024 election? I mean, maybe they've already started and Tucker Carlson is their carrier pigeon. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. Um, you know, granted, that that interview, the whole hype running up to it, X pushing it, everything, the, the attack is on. Moscow is going to use all the systems at its disposal to impact this election. This is it. This is the election for the stake of the fundamentals of America as it has existed for 248 years. It may end this year. That's not exaggeration. That's not hyperbole. Why am I getting upset? I'm a Philadelphian. I'm an originalist on this, all right? And I take it deeply personally to find that there are Americans that are not only complicit in this, there are Americans that think, yeah, Donald Trump dictator, this is what we wanna do for this country. All right, George Washington is rolling over in his grave. All right, this man has no intention of relinquishing power. He's going to stay in power. He, this is the man who praised Premier Xi in China on him remaining in power indefinitely. Praised Putin for that. Praised Kim Jong Il of of South Korea of North Korea for being a dictator, and he loves these dictators. He loves them. All right. Yeah, you are. I can't right. even. That where these words are coming out of our mouth are absolutely it's, it's so scary. So do me this favor then, because mm. if there's anybody that would know, it would be you. I want you to speculate for a second. Mm. All right. What the relationship between Donald Trump and Putin is. When do you think that it started? And how do you think it's going now? <laughs> you see that book rack behind my head? That's all books on the relationship between Donald Trump and Putin. Right. Plot to hack America, plot to destroy democracy, plot to betray America. Good God. I mean, his relationship, it's in, it's it, you know what? I would like to use the word incestuous, except for there's no brother and sister here. OK, what we have going on here is a, you know, uh, 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 how can I put it? Uh, sort of a bear daddy gimp relationship for Donald Trump. Donald Trump has some trigger in his head that makes him completely and totally submissive and subordinate to Vladimir Putin? Is it just the passionate love of raw power? I mean, if you ever if you ever doubt that Donald Trump is not the gimpiest of guys out there, just take a look at that first photograph of Trump and Putin meeting in Helsinki with Trump with his fingers between his legs in that like church steeple and Vladimir Putin sitting back looking at him like the collar is free. I mean, this is utterly amazing that Donald Trump has this one guy in the world, one guy in the world whose approval he wants more than anything. Here's the problem. What if Donald Trump gets into that position of authority to where he executes the exact same policies as Vladimir Putin, right? Then, you know, what is it? Mentor-mentee relationship that they'll have as they destroy? No, 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 not mentor. No, 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 Malcolm. Okay, Malcolm tell me not mentor-mentee. Not mentor mentee. Hmm. No, no. What he's going to be is a copycat. Yeah. Donald is a copycat. He's hmm. watching what Vladimir Putin does to critics. He's watching what Vladimir Putin does in terms of um, stealing wealth from the country. And the funny thing is being that you mentioned Elon Musk and we talk about Bezos, we talk about the rich of the richest in America. Mm -hmm. These are the guys that Donald Trump is going to fuck first. Why? <laughs> because imagine <laughs> they control 20, 20 names, control 80% of the wealth of this country, mm -hmm. 20, round them up, send them over to Mar a Lardo, put them like um, Mohammed bin Salman did on the floor exactly. in, his, in, oh, in his ballroom and turn around and you say to Elon Musk, all right, let me sort of give it to you in a way that even you can understand. Uh -huh. How much are you worth? And he'll say, mm -hmm. I'm worth 300 billion. And Donald will have a SEAL Team 6 guy with a hammer 
smash out his pinky fucking toe and say, yeah, that's not the right answer. I'm going to mm-hmm. keep breaking all your fucking toes until you give me the right answer. <laughs> all right. And he'll turn around and he'll go, 297.8? I, I, I don't know. Smash. Mm-hmm. There goes the second toe, right? As he's crying and bleeding with a fucking toe that looks like a pancake. And he goes, let me give you a hint. It's probably closer to zero than to one. Um, Zero? Right. Now sign this piece of paper transferring yeah. all your wealth to me. Yeah, Trump and industries. Looks, and then he'll look at Bezos and he'll say, how are your toes doing today? Right. Mm -hmm. And on these, he will end up grabbing over a trillion dollars worth of liquid cash, which, by the way, is no different than what Vladimir Putin did. The only difference is it wasn't their toes. It was opening the window. And after they refused to sign it over, they decided that they wanted to learn how to fly. Donald is a copycat. Mm. And what he's going to do is going to be terrifying. It's going to be something for a sci-fi movie that we all think, right, we're living in. It's going to be like a Handmaid's Tale on steroids. Make no bones about it. You know, our problem is that you and I have been screaming this for years, and we have both been right all the time, and now we're talking kooky talk, and we're going to be right because we have moved to a place now in the United States where crazy has dominated. You've got crazies like Dinesh D'Souza, right? Convicted felon who's out there saying today, Trump is Navalny and that the, you know, that the liberals are trying to employ, imprison him and that they're gonna kill him in jail. This is riling up these people. And you know how I track this, by the way, how I track the levels when I wrote that book on insurgency. You know how I track the levels of dissatisfaction uh, amongst the Trump base. I tracked the price of AR-15 ammunition. And pre-COVID, it was about a dollar, no, it was about 31 cents per round. Post-COVID, after all the crazy, it went up to about a dollar 25 a round. Now it's down to about 75 cents per bullet. I want to see as this moves on, whether that trends up, which means these people are stockpiling and the ammunition is becoming Mm -hmm. more dear. As silly as that sounds, I know people, I'm Sure, I am shooter. I know, you know, and people are like, oh, this ammunition is getting, you know, why are you buying bulk 5,000 round packs of, se- of 5.56 ammunition? You know, you're not a comp- com- competitive shooter. These people are now mentally. First of all, nobody up- should be a competitive shooter with an AR-15. That's not the per. That's not the purpose. Uh, I mean, that's that's horseshit, to be honest. You want to be a competitive shooter? Be a competitive shooter with a 22 caliber, right? You know, it's it's the same it's the same shit. I mean, I'm not I, I don't I don't buy that competitive nonsense. They're stockpiling to go to war, and well, that yeah, war and is going to be a civil war, and almost and almost like on cue, okay? As almost like somebody came out with this. If you recall, a couple of years ago, before the election, there was a movie called uh, 13 Hours, the Super Super Soakers yeah. or Super Soldiers of Benghazi, right? Which was this really fanciful account of what happened in Benghazi, but it stoked all those Trump voters up. Well, this spring is a movie coming out called Civil War. And it's about a full-scale armed conflict between Americans. And it will get the mentality of these people who really think this is all just a movie and that Joe Biden is a, is a fake actor and Donald Trump is actually living, you know, running the government through the army. This, by the way, every word I just said to you is what those people say. All right, they're nuts. This will make people believe that there's some re- some feasibility of all of this. And that's it, to say that popular fiction and popular movies and media does not impact us. It will this year. I'm not joking. I wish I didn't even have to say these words, but this country is really going, you know, la la cuckoo land. Yeah. So let let me jump around for a quick second and ask you, do you think that the press has tipped the scales for or against Israel? Because I know that you were recently there as well. And more importantly, what's to blame 
for the worldwide rash of anti-Semitism. <laughs> well, well, this is a relatively easy one, right? I could just knock that off. Well, actually, I do have answers. Let me start with the press. Um, I've had some really big issues with some really big names in the U.S. and global media this year uh, since October 7th. I mean, really big issues. Like, I did not know some of the top writers at the Washington Post, top writers in major news organizations, were really thinly veiling their just straight up Jew hatred and anti-Semitism. And I've warned some of them. And I've actually put out a tweet at one point where I said, when this is over and done with, a lot of you are not going to have careers. There are people in the media right now that as soon as 10-7 went down, their full-time job was to amplify the message from Hamas, right? And the message from Hamas was, you're killing tens of thousands of people in numbers that no one could even possibly count, all right? In these short amounts of time, and that this is genocide. The entire global news apparatus jumped onto that. Now, I've been to can, a lot- can, would, you, would you name one or two of them? Not what, news organizations? Yeah, well, let's say New York Times. Oh, Who no. From the uh, New York I Times. I won't, I won't say the individual's names, all right? But uh, some were, you know, some uh, have moved on to other news organizations out of places where I've worked at. But let's just put it this way. Um, the What I saw was not them objectively viewing the massacre of 10-7. The sympathy for 10-7 in the news media, the objective analysis of it, lasted about a day. Then by the time 10-8 and 10-9 came around, where the Israelis started carrying out serious airstrikes, it was if somebody had switched off a light switch. And the mm. fact that Israel was on the counterattack from the air, and that it was Netanyahu saying it, it delegitimized every operation, everything Israel did. Now, I've been around this for 40 years, right? I've worked in the Middle East in counterterrorism my entire career. I have seen airstrikes. I have helped plan airstrikes. I have seen a lot of stuff. What I saw those first few days in Israel was some extremely precision bombing. But to the news media, it was bombing. Therefore, it was indiscriminate. Therefore, you're killing tens of thousands of Palestinians. You're just aiming and wiping out everybody. Therefore, genocide. And there wasn't even a fraction of a second's hesitation in that. And some really big names in the United States were backing this up. I got into a, a serious fight. I'll tell you what. I got into a serious verbal altercation on Twitter. If you want some entertainment, go to the Malcolm Nance Twitter feed on 10-7 through 10-10. All right? Knives were flying. I had a professor at Georgetown University literally call me a disgusting, disgraceful uh, a pig or Zionist or something. And I hauled him out publicly. And I said, I want to hear you denounce Hamas right now, right now. It took him hours to finally say, well, I didn't agree with what they did, said. The mass murder, the invasion of Israel, the mass murder of all of these civilians is heinous. The United States, when we had 3,000 of our citizens burned to death, we were in the Middle East for 20 years or 40 combined years, if you want to put that together with Iraq or Afghanistan, Syria, and that Israel could not defend itself became the immediate overriding theme of the news media. Let me tell you something. I lived in the Muslim world my whole life. I speak Arabic, multiple dialects. I've lived in that part of the world. I've been to the West Bank. I hadn't been to Gaza, but I've been to West Bank. I've been to Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Yemen. Did I miss any? Saudi Arabia, every country in that region. I've lived in or I've worked in, but I have never seen anything like the pile on that went on after 10-7. And it had one factor. Look, I'm an intelligence guy. My job is to determine the, the single, uh, you know, the, 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 the most common denominator. And the most common denominator of all criticism was that there was the Jews doing this. And when the Syrians killed 600,000 of their own citizens, yep. 
Tens and tens of thousands of children gassed them with sarin and mustard nerve gas. Not one protest. Not one. And at the exact same time as 10-7 went down, Sudan was undergoing a crisis with 6.5 million people were being forced to move, right? With tens of thousands of them had already been killed in the civil war between two warring factions, one run by Russia. Not a word. This is where if it, if, if it ain't Jews, it ain't news. And I, I, I'm going to tell you from the bottom of my heart, I firmly believe this now, right? The level and depth of anti-Semitism I did not know existed amongst people who were my friends, people who call themselves progressives, people who call themselves, you know, open-minded thinkers. I have people right now screaming Zionist. You know, at me, you living in a, you know, you support an apartheid state. Well, I just spent a month in that apartheid state. That is one of the brownest countries I've ever been to. Okay. You got to go hunt for the older Ashkenazi white Jews. You got to go hunt for them. Israel is 80% Mizrahi Jew, which means they're from Syria, Lebanon, Iraq. I interviewed a woman who was an 80 year old woman who was born in Baghdad lived all of her childhood in Baghdad, spoke perfect fluent Arabic. She and I knew streets that I had had to clear, you know, when, or work on when I was in Iraq. It was amazing. Jewish. Wow. You, these people are blind to the fact that almost a million Jews were ethnically cleansed into Israel. And then they come back and they say, well, you colonizers. You can't colonize a country that you have owned for three thousand my count 323 years i think there's another thousand years in there because i didn't throw in the 12 tribes period but that goes back to king solomon right wow. what the <clears throat> yeah it's crazy but you know you brought up netanyahu i mean mm. netanyahu in all fairness seems to be a problem for everyone including mm. president biden What's your opinion on the prime minister? And should Israel do all that they can to finally get rid of him? I mean, he's, to me, to me, he's like a, he's like a, a fungus. You know, you got to get rid of it. It's, it's no good. Look, they agreed to a unity government after 10-7 in which they were going to put everything aside to the, to the completion of the war. Uh, I'm telling you, they are going to have to resolve the Netanyahu problem. It's not a question of optics. It's a question of all the steps that he took. And I said that is this in Israel, I would say this to his face. If I had an interview with him, I would say, you failed at the single simplest job you had. Look, Netanyahu. Well, I, don't know if I, would say, I don't know if I would say it's simple, but he failed at the most important job, most which important is to keep job. the, 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 American, the um, Israeli citizen safe. The defense of the nation. Right. The defense of the nation. This is a guy who, who his brother died in a famous commando raid. He was in Sayeret Mekal. He was in a commando force. The problem is he seems he's too slick by 10 halves. Okay. He is manipulating things. And it is so patently clear. I mean, you know, you feel every time that you hear him talk that, you, you know, you just want to say, shut up and let, you know, uh, Admiral Hagani Make all the statements because every time you talk, you delegitimize your cause. A good leader, a good leader, all right? Like gold in my ear. You know, there was a point where gold in my ear after the 73 war, she said, I failed. I failed this nation, right? We almost came to having to use nukes. I need to go. I need to step down. Not Netanyahu. Netanyahu no. thinks he needs to be saved by this. And if he thinks that this is his salvation, then he hates he the fam. You know who's going to do him in? The people that I met down at Hostage Square, the families of the abducted and the dead. You and know, they're going to march into. Yeah, I was thinking to myself, if I was like the PR crisis manager for the Palestinian Authority, mm. I would turn around and I would say. To Hamas, or if I was the PR crisis for Hamas, give the hostages back. Mm -hmm. The second you give the hostages back, any further action by Israel would be seen by the world as unnecessary and overly aggressive. I don't think mm -hmm. Netanyahu would stop, by the way, right? But yeah. the notion 
And the notion that we're doing it in order to get back the hostages, dead or alive, mm -hmm. I think is bullshit by Netanyahu. First of all, my heart goes out to all of the innocent. And it's Israeli, Palestinian alike. The thing that saddens me, I have not heard one imam, not one, come out and actually hold Hamas, not Palestine, not the mm -hmm. Palestinian people, but hold Hamas accountable for murder, rape, torture, hostage taking, etc. I haven't. And that's sad, because if it was the other way around, I assure you, you would have rabbis from every faith, right? From uh, you're talking <laughs> about Orthodox, conservative, uh, mm -hmm. Satmar, you'd have from the uh, Lubavitch, you would have Jews coming out and saying, this is not right. This should not right. be, this should not happen. And, you know, we'll do everything that we can to help stop it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's absolutely right. Um, you know, I put a tweet out about a week ago, an experimental tweet, where I said, um, if you want this to be a ceasefire, I agree that there should be a complete and total ceasefire on the three following conditions. Hamas ceases fire. Hamas surrenders. Hamas releases the hostages. This mm -hmm. war would end that tomorrow. Yep. Instant. No, not even. It would be ceasefire across all, all line. You know, all hands. Stop. Cease fire. Walk out. What I found in the Free Palestine movement that upsets me more than anything, because like I said, I've lived in the Muslim world my whole life. I have fired the machine gun at over a dozen of my guys' weddings in Iraq and you know, Iraq. And, uh, and, and in other parts of the Middle East, I lived and just moved back from 10 years in Abu Dhabi, um, you know, and I've worked and lived in every one of those countries from Afghanistan to Morocco, right? Love them, love the food, love the people, right? I can get all that food and people in Israel, all in one spot. Uh, but what I found fascinating is not one of them would come out and call for ceasefire from Hamas. Not one of them, none of them would say Why? it's incumbent upon both combatants or would incumbent upon Hamas to stop terrorism. None of them. They tacitly approve this. Many of them, many of them fully approve when they say resistance at any and all costs. That is full endorsement. Here's where I'm going to make a prediction because I said this a little bit earlier. I sort of touched on it because I was shoot, shooting the gun. You know, when this happened with ISIS, Americans who said, I want to go join ISIS, I support ISIS, I'm going to get out and make videos in support of ISIS, they immediately ran afoul of a law called material support to a terrorist group. Hamas is a designated terrorist group in the United States. And I think that over the intervening months, as the FBI starts spooling up, when we have the inevitable self-starting terrorist attack here in the United States by some of these yahoos who think mm -hmm. that they're going to free Palestine by killing someone in Park Slope uh, or, you know, shooting up a mosque somewhere else. We had several of those incidents intercepted. Or, rip, or, ripping, down the, or ripping down the hostage signs, the faces off the yeah. children. Oh, my God. Uh, look, I, you know, I don't ever rip down a hostage sign in front of me. There's going to be a very violent confrontation. I'll take the hit on that because that it's not just the disrespect on the fact that people are killed or abducted. It means you have no respect for them as human beings. Mm -hmm. Look, I went the military's hostage survival school for four years, right? And the first component of a terrorist hostage is to be dehumanized so they can be executed. Of course. And these people are advocating the dehumanization and they're showing their support from the United States. So you ripped out a hostage poster in front of me, eh, it's going to be trouble. So, hey, Malcolm, let me ask you something. Uh, you know, tell me, how do you think that President Biden has navigated the war in Gaza? I mean, is he doing enough? Is he doing too much? And why do so many people get it wrong about Biden's response? What am yeah, I well, missing here? Well, the funny thing is, and this is where we talk about that there is a underlying latent anti-Semitism that we did not know existed in the far left of the United States. 
When I say far left, I'm talking about the same people that were Antifa, same people that were the extremist elements of Black Lives Matter, not the regular old mom and pop Black Lives Matter poster in this window, but the people who were constantly out there activating, being activists, raising money, all right, who were also part of the Democratic Socialists of America and the, uh, you know, social justice warriors, whatever you want to call yourselves, they were looking for something new. And when this flared up, they declared on the same day as 10-7, full alliance with Hamas and the Free Gaza Movement. I remember one of the first things that I did that morning when I, this thing was going on, I was watching it in real time. I was watching live streams of Hamas video, places I had been to. I had been to Ashkelon before. I had been to Sidorot. Here's Hamas teams in downtown Sidorot doing major running gun battles with the police station, live. And these people were cheering it, making posters of the paragliders that went in and massacred everyone at the Nova Music, Music Festival. I have African Americans and Latino Americans and other people and white kids who are calling themselves social justice warriors suddenly material supporting a terrorist group in front of me. I, Amazing. you know, before I wrote my five New York Times bestsellers on Trump, I wrote six books on terrorism and terrorist ideology. And, you know, my platform is very simple. Malcolm Nance is easy to understand. Cross the terror line. You are my death enemy. Right. Yeah, and amen. These, yeah, amen. these people are cheering them, Michael, cheering them. And you know what? Yeah, I'm get it. back from Israel because I've now walked the grounds. I've walked the grounds of those massacres. I've walked the Nova uh, Festival site. I went through Kafaraza and saw where people were set fire and burned to death in their homes and little kids were shot in their bedrooms and all of these things. I've seen the new version of the long video where women were raped, women were murdered. There's one woman was raped and they set fire to her at the Nova Festival. They were, I mean, it's horrible. The, of the 136 deaths that they showed, you know what? I had seen most of those videos where Hamas's channels on the day of 10-7. They were proud of this. They had over 500 GoPro cameras that were recording their gun battles and massacres and even their own deaths, thank God. Yeah. So, you know, for these people who are out there, if you call yourself a supporter of the children of Palestine, Hamas chose this war. Hamas chose that the, 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 as they say in Islam, right? It is God's will, all right? You don't choose anything, God chooses. Well, Hamas chose this time. Hamas attacked Israel. Well, they no. certainly chose wrong this time, I'll tell you that. No, 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 they chose deliberately. They wanted Israel to come in and they thought they were gonna have this Gaza City Stalingrad in the first mm -hmm. week of war, right? When the, when the Israelis held back at our recommendation for three weeks from the ground invasion, and we prepped it like Fallujah, that's when Hamas was getting pounded, getting their tunnels blown out. And then when the Israeli army came in professionally and started eating that city like Pac-Man, people are upset that a major urban war is going on in a major urban city and that every building, every 100 meters is being destroyed. That's called war. And I've got people calling me in my face. That's genocide. No, Rwanda was a genocide. Almost a million people killed on one side with machetes. Uh, Cambodia was a genocide. A million people killed on one side with the intent to eliminate everybody. The yeah, Holocaust. Yeah, the, ho the Holocaust. <laughs> yeah. The Holocaust. Oh, God. I spoke <laughs> I mean, it out for this. So I don't want to hear this from these people who don't know yeah. what a dictionary is. Who are using a loosey goosey term of the the death or partial death of a people? No, that's called war. It's called a war, and you should get a must to stop it now. So let me ask you this then, because MAGA Mike Johnson and the majority in the House have lined up behind Donald von Schitt's and pants and are <laughs> screwing our allies in both Israel and <clears throat> Ukraine. How do you think that it'll ultimately go? Do you, will we abandon our allies? I mean, can Ukraine legitimately survive without us? Without us? I mean, let me be very clear about something. The Ukrainian people are tough, right? And we know, based upon at least what Zelensky is saying, 
they will never give up. But without our help, how long do you think that they could even hold out? Well, first off, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, you know, I'm a, as, as a Ukrainian Army Legionnaire, I've still got guys who are still in the field after two years. Wow. Um, they're not going to lose any ground. They're not, or they may lose a little bit down at Avdivka, which I have no I was at Avdivka pre-war. I have no idea how Avdivka held out for two years. That's just a miracle. That should have fallen on day one, hour one. But Ukraine will not lose any more terrain. The problem is we need to sustain their ability to hold and take back terrain. Ukraine will not lose this war. They were gonna, you know, they will fully mobilize man, woman, and child if that's what it takes to get there. The Europeans are stepping up in terms of artillery support, but the United States, to find that one half of our government are traitors, straight up traitors. I'm saying that in the terms as it was written in the Constitution of the United States, lending material support to a foreign enemy, right? All right, mm -hmm. aid and comfort to a foreign enemy. Granted, we're not at war, but we are letting down a U.S. ally to betray them. And it's Mike Johnson. Someone needs to find out how a man with no bank accounts is living and is in, apparently in the full pocket of Vladimir Putin. That man's got dirty money somewhere. Somebody better get on that in the Justice Department. Donald Trump, well, we know that that guy, since 1977, they've been watching him and they know how to play him like a marionette. He is Putin's ultimate puppet. And the rest of his Kremlin crew, as I called them in my first book, right, with a K, crew with a K, um, the Kremlin crew are all there. All the players are there. And then the Republican Party has flipped over like a passive puppy dog, all right, that will do and say anything Donald Trump says, even if it is to betray the fundamentals of American defense in Europe, including withdrawing from NATO. This is a yep. party of treason. Done. I've said it. I can't believe anyone that swore an oath to protect and defend the United States would say, well, you know, Hitler invaded Europe, so why should we, uh, you know, go through with this uh, even after a Pearl Harbor thing? We're going to have you to know, get You bit. mentioned, yeah, but Malcolm, you mentioned Merrick Garland. And, you know, mm. I have my opinions. But in light of the recent special counsel report on Joe Biden's handling of the classified documents, how do you feel right now about Merrick Garland? Has he bent too far backward to appear unbiased? Because, again... I have my opinions. I think he's I think he's fucking worthless. I really well, do. I think I think Joe Biden picked the absolute worst attorney general. He'd be great for the Supreme Court, but as an attorney general, I think he's ballless. I think he's just shy to do anything. And the fact that this special counsel, what was his name? Her was permitted to say the disparaging things about the president, which were nothing more than gratuitous, was not removed before it was even released. I have even less respect for Merrick Garland, but I'm going to ask you your opinion. You know, this. the thing is, Republicans understand institutionalists, and they know how to play a guy like Merrick Garland, right? You just bowl over them. Bull over them. And what he's going to do is he's going to get up and he's going to say, oh, I'm dirty. First, I have to clean my robes. Then I have to see exactly what was the yard line that we were playing on here. All right. Oh, we're playing rugby, not football. OK, what's the rules of that? And he will go back over and nitpick it. He spent two years before he investigated anything. He Before he even authorized the investigation, completely took the Mueller report, threw it into the trash. It was literally a document of indictments, right? Yeah. Jared Kushner and $2 billion, Justice Department doesn't seem to have any problem with that. None whatsoever. So uh, it, he may have been the worst attorney general pick in American history if this comes to a crashing end. Yeah. Well, look, Malcolm, as you know, the hour, especially when you and I start getting into this, uh, the hour yeah. goes by very quickly. So I have one last question for you. Sure. Fannie Willis on the stand in Georgia to defend her reputation as a yeah. as a prosecutor and a human being yesterday and today sight to behold. 
I think <laughs> I think that people expect black women to roll over, but Willis is refusing to do so. I mean, she was rough yesterday as a witness. You know, she's nobody to play with. Tell me what's your take on Fannie Willis and how the Trump team railroaded her. I got to tell you. So my kids, when I lived in Washington, D.C., went to uh, Benjamin Banneker High School, right? Sure. An advanced high school for smart kids. My kids weren't the smartest, but they made it into Banneker, right? We we're quite proud. So one day I'm calling. By the way, in, see, that's how but- we know that you're not Jewish, Malcolm. Because if you were actually Jewish, you would say, my kids are fucking geniuses. Both of them. <laughs> They're both going to win the Nobel Peace Prize. They're the <laughs> smartest in the class. They're the smartest that the school has ever had. But go ahead, continue. <laughs> so one day I'm hauled into the school and the principal wants to have a talk with me. Right? So I'm sitting in the, in the principal's office. I'm looking around. This woman's got a doctorate from Columbia. Uh, she's got two postdocs from Harvard. Right. And and then she comes in and she had the bearing and the and the command, as we say in the military, the command voice to make me sit up straight in the yeah. chair. That's what I saw from Fannie Willis. What I thought saw was a woman who was like, I have come to this level. This is a hiccup, which it should have nothing to do with this. But here's what's not going to happen. You will not disparage me as a person. You will not bring me down as a human being. I'm going to play your little silly, silly little game. And when I'm done, you're not going to like it. Let me tell you something. From the African-American community, explosive praise for her. Explosive. There's guys on Twitter. When she <laughs> turned around Malcolm and she said, you know, no man, right, is paying my bills. Uh, you know, that it's about it's about to have the relate. And then she turned around and she says, the only man that ever paid my bills is my daddy. I spoke oh. to a couple friends of mine, you know, uh, black friends of mine, and they were like, yeah, amen to that. You know, that she doesn't need a man, right, to pay her bills. That's... <laughs> her, her dad's testifying right now. <laughs> okay, right. you know he's putting a spank on that. So the point is, none of this has anything to do with what the allegations are. It's beyond a fishing expedition, okay? It's not going to save Donald Trump. It's not going to save the rest of them. If, 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 if she, even if she has to rec- decide for the good of the prosecution to recuse herself, her deputies are going to carry this out. They thought yeah. that this was a silver bullet to kill her and kill this prosecution. All right. And maybe they have a fix going on downstream. I don't know. But it is Georgia. Right. So we need to be quite uh, sanguine about that. But no, that is what no woman's fool. And my favorite line, by the way, is don't get cute. <laughs> don't uh-huh. get cute. Yeah. It's like, oh, Jesus. oh, here it comes. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Mary well, Joseph. Malcolm, let me, as always, thank you for joining me. I mean, your your knowledge is second to almost no one. Uh, appreciate you, my friend. Stay safe. We have to continue spreading this message of Absolutely. vote blue because legitimately, and I say this all the time, this is by far the single most important election that we will ever, ever be involved with. We lose more rights. We lose the Constitution. Mm-hmm. You never get it back. Name one person in history who was a dictator on a Monday, like Trump said, he'd be a dictator for one day and then gave up that dictatorship on Tuesday. That yeah. shit just doesn't happen. That well, goes against it, human nature. It'll be what I call a constitutional dictatorship. The constitution will apply to those people who worship him and the rest of you are all going to be ruled over like slaves. Yeah, Malcolm, thank you, my brother. Stay safe and I will definitely have you back. Appreciate you.